Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships can evolve relationships with people evolve as they grow, they grow and change? change. That's when you really, really need to rely. If you want to make this work, if you want to involve this in your dynamic or in your relationships, then you really have to look at the activity or the feelings and try to find something else that makes you feel the same way. Welcome to the Curious Fox podcast. For those challenging the status quo in love, sex and relationships. My name is Effie Blue. Today, I'm curious about how to navigate a mismatch of kinks within romantic relationships. We are all unique beings with unique expressions of self, and this resonates throughout to our sexual expression also. In an ideal world, how we like to show up in our sexuality, what we desire, what we are curious about, the dynamics we enjoy, the sensations we seek align or complementary with our sexual partner or partners. In this ideal world, for those who like it vanilla, end up with others who also like it vanilla and have delicious grade A Madagascan vanilla sex. For those who like a bit of exhibitionism and that with voyeurs who love to give all their attention to their partners doing their thing and delight in every second of it. The tops and bottoms revel in power dynamics. The masochists and the sadists explore pain and suffering of the body, mind and soul. And those who want none of it relax in a cuddle with an ace partner or partners just like them. Unfortunately, not all of us live in this ideal world. It's not uncommon to have mismatched needs, desires, and curiosities. Not everyone can wrap their heads around hitting someone they love, regardless of how much their partner might want it, or feel comfortable just dropping into roleplay. So what happens then? What happens when your partner's kinks doesn't align with yours, or vice versa? To explore this, I invited one of our favorite pro-doms and kink educators back to the show. My name is Mistress Shayla Lang. I am a pro-dom kink educator, owner of the largest female-run dungeon in New York City, and co-head founder of Seven Days of Domination, which is an educational online kink program. We've spoken about kink a ton of times on the show, but we know that we have new listeners finding us on the digital airways all the time. So we think a quick refresher of the basics never hurts. Incidentally, if you are a new listener... Welcome. If you're a curious soul, you belong here and we want to hear from you. Email us, DM us on Instagram or jump into the Facebook group to say hi. The deets for how you can do all of this is at the end of the show. If you've been listening for a while, this invitation is for you too. Okay, okay. Let's go back to talking about kink. Where were we? Oh, oh yes. What's kink again? So kink is, it's honestly, it's so broad. It's so broad. It's everything from furry handcuffs and dirty talk all the way to, you know, very extreme kink. It can be as mild and naughty as you want all the way to this is, you know, very serious. It should be done by a trained medical professional, that sort of thing. Um, kink is also different than fetish. A lot of times people conflate the two. Uh, mm-hmm. Kink is something maybe not traditional. And when I use the words not traditional, I, what I mean is two cisgendered people having P and V intercourse with the lights off in missionary style, right? Mm -hmm. That is what's considered, well, or sometimes what we call vanilla sex. Mm -hmm. And so kink can be something, literally anything other than that. It can be, you know, it can be anal, it can be bondage, it can be pegging, it can be really dirty talk, like a role play. Those are all things that are considered kink. Fetish is still all of those things, but the difference between kink and fetish is that kink is something that is fun to do and gets you off. Fetish is something that you have to do, otherwise Mm -hmm. you're not going to get off. So a lot Mm -hmm. of times you'll see things like foot fetishes are one in 10 people have them. uh, And it's one of those things where Somebody may not be able to get off unless they're thinking about feet or touching about feet, even if they have the world's most wonderful and amazing and sexual, glorious partner. Uh, they may still need to you know, get a little toe lick in there every once in a while. 
I love that. That's such an important distinction. Um, I love that. And and from your definition, that also tells me that everyone's a little bit kinky. Everybody, everybody. Mm-hmm. And you know, I so I just got married, and uh, my husband and I don't we don't have mismatched kinks. We ha- like a lot of the same thing, but the problem is we're both tops. And so we both want to be doing the things. And so the, the intimacy that we have with each other looks very different than the intimacy that we have with other partners. Uh, and so we have what could be considered very, very, very vanilla sex. And I've never had this much really hot vanilla sex in my entire life. In the beginning, I was like, oh, yeah, this is fine. I'm sure that it will wear off after a while. But four years later, I'm still like, yes, turn off the lights, light some candles. Let's do some missionary. It's incredible. <laughs> it's amazing. That's and amazing. it's I'm so I'm like, wow, there's there's a reason why this worked for so long. So I, I love. Yeah, I love it. But everybody is a little bit kinky. Everybody. Mm-hmm. Nice. And then what, what does like, what can be, what are some of the most common kinks that uh, everyone's a little bit kinky? We know that. And then I think we don't talk about it enough because there's stigma and taboos around it. And it's like naughty and dark. And we think that, you know, only sick people are kinky, even though everyone's a little bit kinky, just to kind of shed some light, to bring some of these kinks to light. What are some of the common ones? So some of the common ones, I'd say the most common ones are Things like role play, that's very, very common uh, when you pretend to be somebody else or in a situation that you normally wouldn't be in. And that plays a little bit with power dynamics, like, you know, Mm -hmm. teacher, student or boss, employee or whatever. And there's also, I mean, foot fetish is very, very, very common. Um, Like I said, one in 10 people have some, some variation of that. And then things like bondage, people love bondage for lots of different reasons. It can be something as simple as just, you know, holding your partner's hands against the wall while you're kissing them. I don't know anybody who doesn't think that that's very, very hot, all the way to very restrictive. You know, you've got somebody bound, all four of their limbs are bound, or maybe they have a gag in their mouth, that feeling of helplessness. Uh, people mm-hmm. love bondage um, from the very, very light to the very extreme And I'd say like pegging is really, if TikTok is to be believed, pegging has really Mm -hmm. come into the mainstream, which is beautiful because (laughs) yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Well, it's incredible because like vulva owners and like have, we've always had G spots, right. And Mm -hmm. also like homosexual cis men have known for years and years and years and years and years, like their entire that, you know, there's like men have one too. And so straight men, especially now that we're moving away from the idea that anything in a butt is gay and, you know, a lot in a patriarchal society being gay is bad. Right. And it is not bad and it is, you know, beautiful, wonderful, but also like sticking things in your butt doesn't make you any other orientation than you are. And so, Mm -hmm. and also I'd say that people who don't have penises find it really fun and exciting to penetrate somebody else with a penis. They're like, yeah, I've got big dick energy right now and it's amazing. Yeah. So I'm one of those people. I am a fan of doing the pegging. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. I do like myself some pegging for sure. Okay. Um, okay. What, what are the sort of less common ones, but like they're out there that for people, kinks that are like Ooh, less common. There's so they're, many. They're out there. Mm. I love going down the rabbit hole of these. Um, so, I mean, as a professional dominatrix, I've really, I've seen it all, right? Mm-hmm. I have seen everything. I have seen the very, very weird to the very, very tame. And people's fetishes can get, and I like fetish, not necessarily king, mm-hmm. but people's mm-hmm. fetishes can get so specific. I recently went like tickling is a fairly uncommon kink um that i love 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 doing and but also it gets sort of niche there will be i've had clients bring me a very specific outfit to wear and not you know sometimes i'll bring a nurse costume or a school girl costume or say oh can you wear all latex for me but there have been people who have brought me a very specific style of like workout shorts and nothing special nothing crazy nothing particularly sexy they're just Mm. really 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 obsessed with like this pair of bike shorts from this one brand or people who are obsessed with like sneaker popping. Have you seen that? Oh, this is, this is a a kink that's, I'm not here to kink shame, but this stresses me out. It's where people will like puncture the air bubbles in running shoes Mm -hmm. and that's what gets them off. 
And that, yeah. that's stressful. I can't watch videos of that. If somebody <laughs> tells me they're in a secret sneaker popping, I'm like, you know what? I love you and I support you, but please do it o- over there away, away from, from me. Cause me. I can't, I uh, it makes me like my, I have goosebumps right now. Just like thinking about it. It oh, squicks that's me out. Funny. I mean, it goes really, really, really deep. Um, I've mm-hmm. had people who were really, one of my favorite phone sex clients is really into control top pantyhose. And so he'll call me and we'll just basically say the words control top pantyhose to each other over and over and over again. And it's a role play where I'm wearing control top pantyhose and he'll tell me how much he loves my control top pantyhose. And we just say this over and over and over again. I'm like, yeah, as you lick, you know, just rub your face up against the side of my control top pantyhose. And he goes, Oh, I love your control top pantyhose. It's very, very cute. But like, it's, it's that combination of words, right? Just the right. words that gets him to where he needs to go. So like there's, everybody's got their own thing and you don't even realize it's a thing until it sort of is awakened. Sure. Um, yeah. Do we know where kings come from? No. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is no. I, people will tell you all day, like, oh, well, this was my sort of awakening. This was my sort of, like, this is why I am the way that I am. I have a lot of um, older spanking clients who will tell me all day, all day, oh, my babysitter spanked me and I got my first direction or I was spanked in school and this is my teacher was really hot and, you know, this, that and the other. Or, you know, I had to get an enema as a kid because I was really, really sick and it was the 70s so they did that to children and that really got got the motor running. And so people will tell it like, and you... I will say that there are awakenings for specific kinks, Mm. but I wouldn't say that a switch flips and all of a sudden you're kinky. I had a, I was watching a movie and the thing is, I don't even remember what movie it was. This was years ago that triggered a really sort of temporary fascination with washing other people's hair because it was a scene and it was two women in the bathtub and they both had really long hair and they were sort of like washing each other's hair. And I remember thinking, oh, that looks so hot. Mm. That is so hot. And then, you know, I went around asking people if I could wash their hair for like eight months. It was, (laughs) and so like that, I can tell you that, but I can't tell you if I would have turned out kinkier or less kinky if I'd had some sort of like childhood trauma or a moment in time that was Mm. really pivotal. Some people do, some people don't. My theory on kink is, I think there are three ways. These, this is a pure theory, um, though I would like it to be researched if anyone's out there. My theory is actually kind of combination of all the, th- the things that you're saying. I think I've grouped them into three ways. I think some people are genuinely born that way. I think it is, I think we mm. all have a, sex- a sexual self-expression, just like we have all the other types of self-expression and some people some people's sexual expression is kinky and that that is simple as that like it's not about any specific nurture or experience it's just the way they their sexuality is formed the other version is i think people meet kinky people and it doesn't offend them and they kind of just go along with it because it's exciting, it's different, it's new, they love their partner, they're curious, and they may not be kinky in their next relationship. Then if their next relationship is vanilla, they wouldn't look for it. But they kind of end up with somebody who's kinky and they like the idea of it and they're not offended by it. And that's kind of that's kind of how they are. And the third group, I think, is, you know, people who've had experiences that have really shaped and form that particular thing, you know, it is the it is the spanking from a, a babysitter, or it is the anima, or it is something that is, is sort of shaped it. I think those are sort of my three main groups. Can you think of anything else? I think that you've really nailed it. I think you've really nailed it in that it, you know, it comes from like a specific childhood thing, or just from exposure. Yeah. Uh, I really like that you brought up the exposure part, because I feel like that's really how I've grown in my own kinks. Yeah, I feel like I feel like I, was, I feel very seen right now. I'm like, oh, I never really <laughs> associated that because I didn't consider myself a kinky person when I got into pro domination, and it was more just, oh, this sounds like a weird job. I can learn how to throw a whip, and then I did. And now I think I am definitely into uh, more unusual things than I've ever sure. been before in my entire life, and also been much more open to mm. the idea of extreme kinks or unusual kinks or, you know, something being very, very specific for a very specific motivation. 
than I've ever been before in my entire life. Nice. Yeah. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think you've really nailed it with that sort of like three things mm. there. Yeah. So I think this actually nicely brings us to the topic that we want to explore today, that when the second thing happens, when, you know, one person is kinky and the other person is, isn't, and they want to be in a, you know, in a sexual relationship together. And, you know, in an ideal world, the, the other partner is excited and curious about um, their kinky partner's kinks. And then sometimes they're not. And there is a mismatch of kinks with our partners. What happens then? It's really common. It's really, mm. really very common. And it comes from a lot of like the mismatch can go one of a couple of ways, right? Mm. Your partner comes to you, says, let's use pegging for an example. Your partner says, I really want to peg you or I want to be pegged. Mm. And the, the, so the, maybe for the bottom sake, right? The person who wants to be pegged brings it up to their partner, says, I really want you to peg me. And the top has ne- never done this, has no experience, has maybe watched pegging porn once or twice. Um, or maybe has stuck a finger in somewhere with mixed results and doesn't feel confident that they can do a good job or doesn't feel in- even remotely interested in the idea like, oh, well, that sounds like a lot of work. And so you have a mismatch there. And the sort of important thing, I think there's sort of a system here for the mm-hmm. both the tops and bottoms to determine how they're going to figure this out, right? Because either if one partner really, really wants this to be a part of their relationship, wants this kink, wants this thing to be a part of their relationship, they're either going, like one of, they're going to have to compromise or one of them is going to be unsatisfied. Because if the top gives in to the bottom's desires, but doesn't want to do it, then they're going to feel used or annoyed or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whereas if the bottom just hides this part of themselves from the top and says, okay, well, I guess I'll just never do it, then they can also feel like their needs are not being met. And that's the problem. And if they come, oftentimes if they compromise and say, okay, we'll both just do this, then the, where the top doesn't want to do it and the bottom really wants the top to do it, you know, the bottom may not be getting the experience that they're looking for and the top may be sort of irritated. And so if they say, oh, well, let's compromise and you know, I'll watch you play with your toys or I'll, you know, stick a finger in rather than a whole strap. It's, it's often not what, and both of them are losing something that they want or need in this interaction. Mm -hmm. And so I think the best place to start here is by really looking at uh, the feelings of it. Mm -hmm. The, and not, this is a thing that I think a lot of people confuse is the activity of the kink versus the feelings or the motivations of the king. Mm -hmm. So if you're, let's look at something even like a little bit more risque, like a golden shower, for example, Mm -hmm. a golden shower, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's when uh, one partner urinates on the other partner in whatever form that takes. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think that this is gross and nasty and degrading and disgusting and, oh, I'll never do it. But it's not necessarily, you have sort of core motivations for this. And uh, Princess Callie wrote a book on this. There's like a, there's a workbook um, Mm -hmm. where you can actually, you could buy it and you could just work through it with your partner, which is amazing. But what it does is it looks at the feelings behind the kink because a golden shower can be loving and intimate. It can be worshipful. Like somebody who is receiving a golden shower from me worships me so much that they're willing to consume anything that comes out of me like manna from heaven. Right. And Mm -hmm. so this is, this can be worshipful. It can be sensual. It can be deeply, deeply intimate Mm -hmm. and, or it can be gross, right? It can be gross. I can be praising my bottom and saying, that's right. Drink all of this. I've made this for you. This is something that we share together. Or I can be, you know, somebody can be laying on the floor after I've, you know, spanked them a whole bunch and they're feeling really tender. And then I could be like, yeah, now I'm going to humiliate you by peeing all over you, you dirty slut. Like that, you know, that can be something that they desire Mm. to be degraded, to be humiliated, to be taboo, to be super, Mm. super gross and just live out their grossest fantasies. So there's motivations in there. Um, Mm. Somebody who maybe wants their partner to peg them, but doesn't, they're, you know, the top doesn't want it. It can be administered in a loving, intimate, beautiful way, or it can be delivered in sort of a porn star, I'm going to rip you open and take what's mine kind of way. You know, and so identifying those feelings and bringing that up to your partner may help you get on a little more even ground 
If Mm. you like to be tied down and called names, that's a little bit different than if you want to be tied down and cherished, but also ravished. So it can be so many different things. And you really have to start with the feeling behind it and identifying that. Because once you find that feeling, you that feeling will translate to so many other things. So say your partner really, really just is super, super, super squicked out by pegging, right? Super squicked out. Maybe, but you see this as something that's like beautiful, intimate, like your partner is inside of you, is, you know, kind of taking you from the inside out and you're doing something really taboo and dirty and um, you know, it would be really shameful if other people knew, maybe you translate that into something else, like a, like a role play where you are humiliated and yet sort of like taken and cherished and evis- like eviscerated, ravished. And so you find that feeling and that, that way, maybe you find something that your partner feels a little more confident in doing, or feels a little more enthusiastic about while still getting that same desired feeling at the end of it. I love that. It it makes so much sense. And I think it also allows people to sometimes you want the feeling that you don't even know how you want to have it. So it could actually be a really nice conversation to have with your partner to say, I want to feel ravished. And then for, for you to figure out together, like how to get to that feeling as well. And maybe that might, that might bring some, I can totally see how that might bring somebody in because then you're kind of like, you know, nerdy brainstorming, like all the the pleasure and then all the ways that you can get to that feeling and maybe they feel more included rather than being sort of demanded from or, you know, um, feel obliged and all, all the other kind of things and, um, and, and, and end up being a common ground that it's a sort of sexual exploration. Absolutely. Well, and that's, that's, the, that's the other thing is when the, you know, the partner feels that it's sort of thrust upon them. And it's, this is, I find that this is a common mismatch and this gets into like sort of relationships, di- relationship dynamics. There's always the partner that's like, sort of feeling the need to manage and provide, um, a lot of times Mm -hmm. and, or especially, especially when it comes to like heterosexual relationship dynamics, one partner is like, you know, the manager and the other one is the, okay, I, you know, I do all these other things. And so I find that a lot of cis women in general or women or folks who've been socialized as female often feel the need to sort of be the best at everything that we do right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And we get overwhelmed Mm -hmm. when we're presented with something that like, we don't know how to do. And also it somehow involves our relationships. Mm. And we're like, well, I don't want to disappoint this person, but I also don't want to do this thing. And so what do I do to get in that? And it, it causes often can cause some resentment. It's like, well, why would you, why would you tell me this? Like, why would you ask me to do this? Because this is mm. just another thing that I have to deal with on top of the laundry and the dishes and, you know, walking the dog and mm. all of these other things. I mean, depending on whatever your relationship dynamics are. And so they often feel compelled to, oh, this is another thing I have to learn how to do and get really good at. Mm, yeah. How would you, and that's so real. <laughs> what you just described is so, so real. Um, you know, I've, I've been coaching uh, people in their relationships for, gosh, like over seven years now. And I, and I hear this, like this is a, a weekly occurrence. I have this conversation with somebody. Um, <laughs> it's so, so real. What should we do? What, some, that's happening, you know, you're either the person that's obliged or you're the person who's asking for this. How do we handle that situation in a way that it doesn't feel like an obligation to the other person? Bringing it up outside of intimacy, for mm-hmm. sure. Like, don't wait until you're in the moment. Don't surprise somebody with this. Don't just come home on your anniversary with a big bucket of sex toys saying, I thought we could do this tonight. I think bringing it up in a situation or when there's like, when the chores are done, when the kids are in bed, when everybody's relaxed, um, can be a little bit less of a shock to people. Like I had no idea you were into this. So bringing that up in a very like non, when there isn't so much stuff going on, uh, is a, is a good way to start. And also never bring it up right after (laughs) intimacy, because that can (laughs) often make people feel like, wait, so what we just did wasn't good enough for you. Uh And so bringing that up, I find that in the so in the pro domination realm, uh, my clients will email me. Right, they will send me an email. They will say, "This is the kind of experience I'm looking for," and it's in an environment where we're we haven't met face to face. They're not calling me on the phone. They're not springing anything on me. I check their email during e- when I do my emails, and I I look at it and I go, oh, "Okay," and then it gives me time to think. Can I accommodate this? Do I want to accommodate this? Mm-hmm. And nobody's feelings are hurt, right? Because 
they can't see my face when I open the emails. And so I'm not making a face that's like, oh, I don't know about that. Um, which luckily, knock on wood, doesn't happen that often uh, mm. because I, granted, I love the weird. I find this an interesting problem to solve. Mm. So I'm like, oh, bring it on. But it's, it's important to do this in a time where everybody's relaxed, everybody's calm. And also to think about it, because if you present something to somebody and say, hey, I would like for you to tie me to the radiator and call me a dumb bimbo while you rail me from behind, that very hot, right? But can also lead to uh, surprise and shock. And maybe they don't see, you know, maybe they don't see their partner as a dumb bimbo who they want to mm-hmm. rail from behind. Maybe they see their partner as a smart accomplished, loving, wonderful human. And they may feel bad about calling them names or, you know, just like taking them very rough. And so if you, you know, you say things like, well, I like to do this maybe as, as a role play, right? I want to be your partner and I want you to take some ownership over this because I love you. I care about you. I support you. And, you know, in this life, and I also want to be like that in our sex life. And so leading with, I like to feel this way as long as that's not happening in a place where they can be surprised and taken aback. I'm like, no, I never want to do that because that can actually hurt both people's feelings. Mm. If I say, Hey, I would like you to slap me across the face. And my partner goes, I would never do that. Are you kidding? And I go, well, now I'm hurt because you love me. Why wouldn't you want to slap me in the face? Mm. And you know, my partner's horrified because why would I ever hurt the person that I love? And so reframing it as I feel loved when you slap me across the face, I feel owned and cherished and adored and just like like your wonderful little present when you slap me across the face so I love that framing I think that framing is really powerful to actually pair up how you feel with this activity that otherwise could be perceived as aggressive or hateful or you know bad Uh, but to actually kind of frame it in a way like this is how it makes me feel like I feel this way when this happens I think it's such a powerful way of going about it and I think also I love like do it when there is room for discussion I think when you're in the throes of it if you you know middle of intimacy or just about to get there to bring it up I think there isn't, there isn't there isn't any wiggle room like you either gonna do it or not no. do it and then it's gonna kind of ruin the mood I love that you're saying like do it off site you know it's this is not about sex yeah. it's about uh, communication so bring it up love it that is. framing and then kind of say like how does that make you feel uh, and have a conversation about that and and then once you've sort of ironed things out outside the, the bedroom bring it in you know turn the lights on and play I love that and there's also a lot of room for for trial and error, bringing it into the bedroom. Mm-hmm. Because if you treat this, I love what you said earlier about like a nerdy planning session. If you treat this, like, <laughs> I don't want to say the kinks are a problem, but if you treat it as sort of like us against the problem and not, you know, you're doing this for me or I'm doing this for you or whatever, um, or I'm planning everything and you're just going to lay there and take it, which can also be hot if that's what you're into mm-hmm. kind of asking what, like for the other person's input, if we're going to start playing with bondage, right. I, you know, your partner may prefer to pick out their own restraints that you want to tie your partner down and they really don't like the idea of handcuffs, right? Because maybe say you have a pair of handcuffs that somebody gave you as a gag gift 10 years ago. And you're like, Oh, great. You said, yes, you want to do bondage. I'm going to handcuff you to the bed. Like that may be a mood killer once you do it because you get them too tight it starts to cut off the circulation you're kind of freaking out you can't it's not it's not good and fun to be introduced to this new thing and while you're in it if you're thinking about like oh i'm i might lose all the circulation in my hand and that won't be very sexy at all so involving your partner in this like what kind of strap on harness feels good to you and makes you feel really powerful Mm -hmm. uh what kind of restraints feel the best against your skin uh, what sort of role play do you feel really confident pulling off? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. are you my boss or are you an alien from space who's going to probe me? Right. Mm-hmm. And kind of taking off from there and, and, you know, doing it like a, like a plan, like you're planning a vacation because you kind of yeah. are, right. You kind of are. I love that. And, yeah. and going from there. I imagine the other thing that sort of almost looking at it from, so we, we talked about start with the feeling and then try to create and brainstorm and co-create situations and activities and co-create an environment where you can get to those feelings. And I think um, maybe on the flip side as well, as you're trying to negotiate this with your partner, it would be interesting to explore 
what's their resistance? Like, if they don't want to do it, if like that's where the mismatch is, right? One one person wants it, the other one doesn't. It would also be, I imagine, it would be interesting to explore why they're resisting. Like, what is what piece of it that they're not um, comfortable doing, and then see if there could be some shifts around that. Uh, what do you think about that? Oh yeah, that's and that's huge, right? That's a huge thing. Um, listening to the to the nose, like what's your initial reaction to this? Where does that go? Um, I, I like to recommend twelve step work for some of this stuff, um, like recovery programs, twelve step recovery programs, because they have a really great thing called a fear inventory and a fear inventory and a resentment inventory, and it's it's worksheets. You can just they're all over the place, right? You can uh, Google them, and there's eighteen different versions. But going in saying, what am I scared of? Uh, what am I scared of? What am I resentful of? What am I worried about? And why am I worried about these, these things? What does it affect? And so when you have a very visceral like no, or even like an uncomfortable, like I don't want to do that, that comes from somewhere, right? And some of those places are really valid. Maybe your partner wants to get really into like latex, full body gimp suits, but you have a latex allergy. That's very real. And that would make sense. And so maybe you tell your partner, Hey, I have a latex allergy. Can we switch to PVC instead? Or your uh, partner really wants to be feminized, right? And very much wants to be feminized and, uh, you know, wants you to wear the strap on and wants you to sort of go to town and call them a pretty little slut. And, but you, you know, maybe don't feel comfortable putting your partner in a dress or a wig, or you don't find that attractive. Looking at that no and really digging into why. Are you scared that you're not going to do a good job and that's somehow going to lead to the end of your relationship? That's obviously going to the worst possible outcome. But it's good to know that, right? It's good to know that. If my partner says, I want to do this kink and I don't feel confident doing the kink, then I might be worried and in my own head that I'm not doing a good job. My partner isn't having a good time. Maybe my partner seeks someone outside the relationship to fulfill this need. And that doesn't fall within the dynamics of our relationship. Maybe we're monogamous and I don't feel comfortable with them seeing somebody else, but I can't provide it, but they need it. All of a sudden we're going to break up. You know, that's Mm. obviously the worst possible, just just because I don't want to wear a strap on, Um, which Mm -hmm. is obviously the worst possible thing, but we often leap to the worst possible conclusion without taking a step to look at everything that's in the middle. Mm. And we have this sort of visceral reaction to stuff. Mm. And it could be, could be like reasons that aren't really negotiable, uh, Mm. like the latex thing, or maybe your partner wants to engage in toilet play, but that's really something that really, really makes your stomach upset and just the Mm. thought of it. And, you know, you can sit down with your partner and say, Hey, I, this is why I don't want to do this. It's not Mm. because that I don't love you. It's not that I don't want to fulfill your fantasies and have fantasies Mm. with you together involving this type of thing. It's just, I, I really, the idea of peeing on you stresses me out or the idea Mm. of playing with diapers. Like, you know, the kids are grown. I swear I'd never change another diaper. I'm absolutely Mm. not changing your diaper. Um, No matter how much, no matter how hot you think it is, that sort of thing. Mm. It can be a roadblock. Some of them are overcomable and some of them are not. And when it comes to the stuff that's not overcomable, that's when you really, really need to rely. If you want to make this work, if you want to involve this in your dynamic or in your relationships, then you really have to look at the activity or the feelings and try to Mm -hmm. find something else that makes you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Say your partner really wants to get into diaper play and you figure out why they like the diaper play. Does it make them feel, you know, disgusting and a little bit incapacitated? Does it make them feel, you know, warm and squishy? Does Mm -hmm. it make them feel uh, like age regressed or embarrassed or ashamed or, you know, whatever? Mm. find activities that fit in slot into any of those motivations or those feelings Mm. and then go from there. Maybe if somebody just really likes the feeling of squishing around in their own mess, you fill a kiddie pool with shaving cream and you go to town with each other. Like that's very, Ooh, or one of those paint kits. Have you seen those paint kits where they, Oh, you you body paint and then you, yeah, Yeah. that's a good one. It's on my list that that it's um, for those who you don't know, Essentially, you paint your body, you paint each other's bodies with body paint and there's like giant canvas and you have sex on it. And then it's like this modern art piece that no one can really tell what happened, 
unless you like sometimes you like butt prints and hand prints and everyone's like this is an interesting piece of art then you like hang it in your living room where everyone can see well, you know what happened but nobody really knows it's definitely on my list oh same same the thing that I'm it's coming up for me as well like I love what you said about the, that first visceral no that comes out of you what I find is that somebody suggests something and this happens with non-monogamy too like I see this with clients all the time one person will say I'm interested in being non-monogamous and the other person who's received this information has a version of non-monogamy that pops up in their head whether they're conscious or or, or that or not and that's what they're reacting to whereas we know that non-monogamy can come in, in, in a bajillion different ways but there is something a version of it that comes up in there pops up in their minds and that initial reaction is coming from that image and it's always worth investigating oh, yeah. in that image and i feel like this is a similar with kink like somebody says hey would you be interested in spanking me Again, spanking, it could look, like you said, it could look in so many different ways, right? But the thing that pops up in their head, it could be maybe this idea of this aggressive kind of relentless hitting the person that you love. And of course, their first reaction is like, no, I would never do that. Or especially men who being socialized, you never hit a woman, right? Which is a great way to be socialized, yeah. right? For them, that's sure. what is what it's being what, what it's kind of tapping into. They can't imagine a maybe in that moment they can't imagine a version of spanking that's like loving and sensual and you know warm and slow and intimate. And maybe if they were to to get to that image, their resistance would would erode as well. Do you think that that's also absolutely like, they sort of tied in with the feeling, right? Yeah, and I think coming at it from a place of feeling, saying something like you know, I find it really intimate. I find it really sensual to be, you know, over like laying over your lap and sort of exposed in front of you. If you wanted to do like an over the knee spanking, I could be close to you and I could just kind of lean my body weight on you. And then maybe you give me a couple of light taps on my ass while you're saying dirty things to me or while I'm saying dirty things to you. I think framing it as, you know, I want to be intimate with you. I want to be close to you, but I also really love these sensations and these, these ideas and these feelings, uh, bringing that to your partner rather than saying, Hey, I, I really like for you to spank me. Like, because that sort of frames it as here's something you're doing. You're not doing in the bedroom that I'd like for you to do to here's an experience I want to have with you together. Yeah. And the balance to that as well with the resistance piece, because I think it's also worth addressing is other than the ickiness and everything else. And sometimes it is you don't want to do it because there's a feeling that's in the way. And there's often shame, it's guilt, right? It's it, it, fear of failure, um, like you said. So I think it's a, it's for the person who is resisting, like he doesn't want to participate in the, in the kink, they, they, they also need to do some internal, you know, some self-inquiry is like, is it really that I don't want to do this? Like, is it really a visceral no? Or is it, am I holding on to some shame, some guilt, some, you know, some something that I've been fed that tells me not to do it. And it's not really an authentic no, but more like I haven't really figured out the feelings around it. And I think that you're right. I think just figuring out the feelings around, around this is really the key. And I think for both, for both sides, not just the person who wants to have the experiences, but also those who, you know, want to facilitate some of those experiences and maybe resisting it. Yeah, hugely so. And that's why sitting down and doing that inventory is just so important. Yeah. And I think maybe the other thing to add in there is the, probably the the important thing is as you are having these conversations with your partner or partners is to be mindful of not creating pressure and not being coercive. Oh, I feel yeah. like those are the two kind of the qualities that you have these conversations because people can get really passionate. Like they want, especially if they've been holding it back for a long time and they haven't said it and it's been years and they got to a point where they're just like must have these experiences and they could have a sense of urgency. And I think in those moments, making sure that you're not being, you're not putting pressure on somebody else uh, and you're not being coercive is kind of really important. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because from, from bringing it up to your, because the thing is, if, if you're kinky and you have certain kinks and your partner, and maybe you've been with your partner for a while, or, you know, maybe not, but you've, you've, you probably knew you had these kinks for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And so you've had time to deal with any sort of shame or guilt you felt mm -hmm. around it. And so to expect your partner to do all of the emotional work that you've done up until this moment in, you know, maybe just the span of a few hours, say you bring it up at breakfast and by the afternoon, you're like, all right, ready to go. And they're like, no, absolutely not. Yeah. 
And so don't pin that urgency on them. And also sometimes it takes people to do some time to do the work, Mm -hmm. right? Especially if there is when there's shame and there's guilt Mm -hmm. involved, Um, you've already undone whatever it is, right? You've come to terms with it, but it takes other people a lot longer sometimes have to be patient with your partner because ultimately you do want to do this with them. And these things do take time to really come to fruition. Also, if it's a feeling, say you're the top and you want your bottom to do something, say, I really want to spank my partner, but my partner does not like pain. Sometimes it takes getting used to the feeling when we Mm. stub our toes or when we get a paper cut, we're used to that, right? So we know what it's going to feel like We know the terms we use in in BDSM are thuddy versus stingy because a Mm. lot of times people know what a thud feels like and what a sting feels like. And so you can be prepared for that. You can generally tell once you've experienced a little bit with the implements that we use, like a flogger or a paddle or a whip or whatever, you know, you can tell your partner, I really prefer thuddy to stingy or vice versa. You know what's coming. You can better prepare for it. And you may even learn to love it. It gets complicated when it comes to other things, right? Because we have, there's thuddy and stingy are the most common, but then you also have zappy, like electrical play. I have very, very, very heavy masochist clients that I love playing with, but the moment I touch them with a thing called a violet wand, which is where it sends a little tiny, little tiny arc of electricity. It's like a a bug zapper or a shock collar, but very, very tiny. And they will hit the ceiling because they're not used to that electrical feeling. Or if Mm. I put out a cigarette on somebody or even just threaten to, uh, Mm. they will hit the ceiling because they are, they're not used to this type of pain. Their body Mm. is immediately going, Oh my God, I don't want this. I'm uncomfortable. I've never done this before. This is bullshit. We're not going to do this ever again. So sometimes it takes a lot of little baby steps to sort of gently ease into the pool of sensations or mm-hmm. play if and this can be emotional too if you're not used to calling your partner a dumb dirty slut it may feel really shitty in the beginning and mm. you know you may you may just start with you're a slut right yeah. and then you add you're a dumb slut and then you go into you are a filthy little pig whore aren't you and you're a <laughs> filthy little pig whore like you know that that sort of thing, right <laughs> sure into it. Yes. I love that. I love that. Um, Good advice. Good advice. Okay. Let me ask you, let me see what we can do with the, I guess the worst case scenario. So we've had a lot of gentle talking, compassionate, generous, open. We did research. We tried a few things. We've, you know, processed feelings. We read about things. We did some trial and error and we came to a point where there is just a mismatch and we're not going to be able to find a satisfying middle ground that works for everyone and feels everybody you know, safe, comfortable, which is what we all deserve to be in relationships. What do we do? What do we do when there is no common ground? I mean, not a, not a lot. You have a couple of different avenues. If this is something that somebody needs, say somebody has like a fetish, right? Versus mm-hmm. a kink where this is something they need to get off. Mm-hmm. They probably would have told you about it in the beginning. Otherwise you would have just noticed their noticeable lack of orgasm, or maybe they've been faking it the whole time. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, But let's use a really common one that's often hardwired in like foot fetish. If Mm -hmm. somebody needs to see, touch, think about smell or taste feet in order to have an enjoyable sexual experience and you say, I don't know, you are a double amputee. You have no feet. And so you cannot possibly provide foot fetish to your partner or you are extremely, extremely ticklish and any sort of foot touching squicks you out you're not going to be able to interact with this with your partner. And so, Mm. but your partner needs this, right? You've only got a couple of options, maybe seeing a professional Mm -hmm. or uh, playing with others. Uh, A lot of times people will send, I have one client who his wife was the one that made the booking. She makes the booking every time. And Mm. she emails me, she says, this is my husband. This is his ID in case you wanted to screen him to make sure that he's not a serial killer. Uh, here's what he's into. Here's what I feel comfortable letting you do to him. Um, these are my boundaries and these are his boundaries. And, and it's great, right? Because she mm. is physically unable to do the things that I can do. And he gets his needs met. And it's different, right? Because I don't love her husband. I think he's a perfectly nice dude and I enjoy playing with him, but I'm, you know, I don't want to cook him dinner and come home to him even in any stretch of the imagination. 
And so she's not worried that I'm going to infringe upon their relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm strictly providing a service, right? You know, I don't know how to change the oil on my car and neither does my husband. And so we're going to take it to an oil change place because it has to get done. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, what I do is almost exactly the same as any other service worker uh, is I'm fulfilling a need and their relationship. He's like, the husband is able to focus on the things that make both of them happy when he doesn't have this sort of itchy feeling in the back of his head. In my own personal, in my marriage, uh, we both have needs that we can't meet for each other. And so we see other people, right? We see other people. I get a lot of my needs scratched at work. Um, He gets a lot of his needs scratched at parties. And we are not only super comfortable with that, we went into our relationship from the get-go as an open relationship. And we have very clear boundaries, very, you know, we talk about our experiences with others And we're both very supportive partners. I understand that there are some needs that I will never be able to meet for him. And I am thrilled that he's getting those needs met, right? Because A, I don't have to do it, (laughs) which is nice because I didn't want to do it in the first Mm -hmm. place. And then also, you know, he's able to be his, his, his whole authentic self, right? There's no part of it that he has to suppress, that he has to hide, that he has to Mm. get met in unsatisfactory ways, maybe by watching it rather than like physically experiencing it. And it's the same for me. There are things that he will never be able to do for me. And when I come home and I say, let me tell you all about the day that I just had, he's like, fuck yeah, babe, that's amazing. And Mm so, you know, non-monogamy is not for everyone and Mm. it looks different ways and is different for all people. But I highly recommend that if you, you know, maybe trying this or maybe uh, like in the article that you wrote about hiring a sex worker, like maybe bringing them in, bring in a sex worker or don't bring in a sex worker or, uh, or be supportive in any way. Say you're not, you know, you're not comfortable with non-monogamy. Find out how your partner can, can get that itch scratched. If not by you, I would sit down and say, look, babe, I love you, but there's absolutely no way that I can do that. And here's why right? Here's why, here's my feelings about it. I've thought about it. I've, you know, written out some of my feelings. This has nothing to do with you and 100% to do with this kink. Um, It's just not something that I can ever fulfill for you. How do you think that you could get this need fulfilled on your own, if not with another person? Maybe it's porn, maybe it's, you know, erotic fiction, maybe it's, thrill seeking in other ways. Um, Mm -hmm. I find that a lot of the more extreme kink just comes from thrill seeking. Mm -hmm. I get the same kicks from, you know, stabbing somebody as I do from riding a roller coaster. So obviously that's not going to be a replacement for your intimate and loving spanking, Mm -hmm. but it can be. So figuring out where this comes from and saying, how can you, how do you think you can, you can execute this without me being involved even a little bit and then be supportive of that. If you walk in and your partner is watching, you know, triple gangbang anima porn where everybody's suspended from the ceiling by their toenails, like, you know, you don't, don't be shocked. Just be like, Oh fuck. Yeah. My toenails are intact. Like have a, have a good time, honey. Have a good time. Yes. Nice. I love that. And I think that's also it. like no kink shaming is I think should just be at the top of the list. It yeah. might not be your thing, but no kink shaming, I think is a, is a good, good ethos to have. And I also just want to second the, the idea of bringing in a professional. I have, I've had many clients where bringing in a sex worker, bringing a professional was the answer, you know, because um, I mean, m- multiple clients where I've dealt with where they've come to this idea that they want to open up a relationship because they had a mismatch kink. And they, the, the solution they'd come to was to open up a relationship, but they weren't non-monogamous people. Like they didn't really want to be in a non-monogamous mm. relationship, but they just, all they could have imagined is to have somebody else involved. And it was, it was rocking. It was like, it was rocking the relationship and not in a good way. They were mm. coming, they were overwhelmed by emotions and neither of them wanted it, but they just couldn't think about anything else and were focused on the kink. And, and when you kind of say, Hey, you know, like you don't have to change the entire structure of your relationship and, you know, schedule these crazy, you know, change your schedule with your three kids and all these other responsibilities. So this one person can have this one kink. Like let's talk about professionals. Like these people know what they're doing. They're not going to fall in love. They have better boundaries than any of us in this room right now. (laughs) 
<laughs> and you can learn a thing or two and it's a it's a very clean very you know good experience and it doesn't mean you can't be regular it's like you can still have the intimacy and the closeness and the familiarity that you can have with a with a sex worker over a course of time you can see them you know weekly monthly whatever that makes sense for you and still feel like you get to know the person and they will hold boundaries better than anybody so I really oh, yeah. do want to put that put that that idea that if if you if you have a mismatch and you're a, a loggerheads and and no one's moving and you know even the non monogamy just feels like the scariest thing in the world, consider working with a sex worker. There there are great ones out there, and um, well, I'll definitely link on the show notes to the article that we wrote about how you find a good one, how you make sure that you know they're in a good position themselves, and how you you know what you need to know, what you need to tell them. And go for it. I would say just try it even once, just for the experience. The absolute worst thing that can happen is you don't ever have to do it again. Miss Shayla, thank you so much. It is always a really pleasant experience talking to you and so much knowledge and so much like exciting stuff. So I really, really appreciate your time. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming on the show. Oh my God, thanks for having me. I love, I love this podcast. Before we go... Foxy friends, it is time for some audience participation. We have three fun, quick and easy ways for you to be involved with Jacqueline, me and the podcast and help us challenge the status quo in love, sex and relationships. First, we're doing a call for your funny sex stories. Back in episode 153, Jocelyn Silva and I had a great laugh about her attempts to talk dirty while hooking up with people in her travels around the world and her hilarious miscommunication during one steamy encounter in Spain. You reached out to us to say you love that story and wanted to hear more sexy mishaps. So, here's your chance to be on the show. Get your voice memo app and record your funny, sexy story and send it to us to listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. And you don't need to include your name if you don't want to. Second, in my four and a half minutes of spare time, I opened an Etsy shop. It's a place for me to create products that I want to wear and use from bags for femme lesbians and bisexuals who want to make it very clear that we are not just allies to shirts that declare that I'm with him and her to tote bags that proclaim that I've got 99 problems and white hetero mononormative patriarchy is basically all of them. The Etsy shop is filled with fun pieces, each designed to help us challenge the status quo and celebrate the beauty of pride. Use code podcast to get 10% off through the end of July. And if you're in the U.S., get free shipping straight to your door. Visit the Roots and Wings Gallery on Etsy or find the link in our show notes or in my Instagram bio. Finally, one huge way that you can support the podcast is by connecting with the show on your favorite podcast app. This can be a heart, favorite or a follow button. Also, rating the show and leaving a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. We don't have advertisers or sponsors, so we rely on our community of listeners to spread the word. If you enjoy the show, or if any of the episodes have meant something to you, write a quick review as soon as this episode is over. Remember that the best way to stay in contact with us is via our newsletter, where you get new episode drop emails, monthly digest, and themed emails, where we curate and share all of our episodes about opening up, jealousy, sex, and more. Jump on our website, wearecuriousfoxes.com, and sign up for our newsletter. And while you're there, check out all the blog posts, resources, reading list recommendations, and so much more. To connect with Miss Shayla, jump on Instagram at yesmissshayla, or visit our website, yesmissshayla.wordpress.com, where you can book a session or attend a class. If you'd like to listen to more episodes on sex, kink, and communication, check out the new episode drop email from Curious Fox in your inbox, where you'll find show notes, links mentioned on the show, along with other episode suggestions that we think you'd love. If you're not getting those, you are missing out. So jump onto our website, wearecuriousfoxes.com, and sign up to the newsletter. And of course, while you're there, check out all the blogs and the resources and the reading list recommendations and more. If you want to weigh in on this topic or connect with other Foxy listeners, head to Facebook and join our Facebook group. We are Curious Foxes. If you find our episodes interesting and helpful, please share our podcast with a friend and quickly rate the show or leave a comment. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, or connect with the show however makes sense in your favorite podcast app. This will take a few seconds of your time and will have a big impact on us. To support the show, join us on Patreon 
where you'll find mini episodes, podcast extras, and over 50 videos from educator-led workshops. Go to patreon.com forward slash we are curious foxes. And let us know that you're listening by sharing a comment, a story, or a question by emailing us or sending us a voice memo to listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. This episode is produced by Effie Blue with help from Yamur Erkishe. Our editor is Nina Pollock, who always finds a common ground with us. Our intro music is composed by Dev Saha. We are so grateful for their work and we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox Podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind and we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. 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 Stay curious.